During the Dark Ages, millions of martyrs shed their blood for Jesus Christ. When the mark of the beast is enforced, the Bible says that more will die. Are we ready to die for Jesus? The time to get ready is now. A thousand years before there was a Protestant, there were Sunday laws that originated in pagan sun worship. For centuries, the church ruled the world until the Protestant Reformation. Men like Martin Luther championed personal and religious freedom. Thousands fled to America to seek freedom from religious tyranny. Will Protestants and freedom-loving Americans fight to keep freedom alive, or will we descend into a modern dark age? The Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. Episode 4, Preparing for Persecution. Welcome to part 4 of the Sunday Law Crisis, What You Need to Know. It's a fact that throughout history, Christians have suffered for their faith. The Apostle Paul had his head cut off under the reign of Emperor Nero. John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. Christians throughout the Dark Ages have suffered. Christians have suffered under communism. They've suffered in North Korea. They've suffered in Russia. They've, they've suffered in China. The Bible tells us that when the final crisis hits, more will suffer who stand up against the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast, which as we've studied is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church. And his image, which represents a duplication of Catholicism in America and they have not received his mark. And we've talked about how the mark of the beast is the mark of Rome's authority, where they have changed the Sabbath into Sunday. Sunday really goes back to pagan sun worship, compromises uh, with the surrounding culture. Uh, it also came about historically as a result of hostility to Jews, and Rome now claims it as a mark of their authority. They've claimed that they made the change, and prophecy predicts that someday that mark will be enforced by law around the world. But God will have a people who stand up against this, who don't go along with it. They don't get the mark in their foreheads, representing their minds, their thinkings, uh, or their hands, which represents their actions. But they are totally on the side of Jesus and Bible truth. And it says that they will eventually live and they will reign with Christ. They will be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes again. My guest today is Pastor Ignatius Shaviano. I want to make sure I say that right. You do it. Uh, you are a retired Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and you have suffered for your faith uh, in a, a concentration camp in Cuba. That's correct. And I want to hear more of your story. That's why we're here. Our, our topic today is called Preparing for Persecution. Uh, you've been through things that I've never been through, and I trust that if I ever have to go through those kind of things, that the Lord will give me the strength uh, when I'm in the midst of, of my trials. So just give us a little background, and uh, I understand that when you were 17, you were a musician, but something happened that, that changed your life. The Lord came into my life, and I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And I had great plans. I went to study at college. And this was in Cuba? In Cuba, what used to be called the Antillian College. And I was preparing for the ministry. Uh, it was a month since my wife-to-be have said I do to my proposal. Mm -hmm. And so I was ready to go, graduate, conquer the world for Jesus, and so on and so forth. But God had different plans. There would be an interruption. And um, during that time, uh, I would taste what the raft of the devil could possibly be. And so, you know, we were taken, uh, 12 of us from the college. Seems from that the, the government- seminary. From the, the seminary. The Seventh-day Adventist. And, and how old seminary. were you at that time? I was 20. Okay. I was 20 then. And uh, they took us, uh, took us to a state And you say they, they took, to, to, just again, who, who took you? Oh, the government. Um, the government. They yeah. sent soldiers yeah. to the school, yeah. and they took yeah. you. They, they took us. They uh, take us long ways in a train. We finally arrived to a place. I didn't even know where we were. And uh, in the middle of the night, they loaded all the people, thousands of them, in trucks. And we, the, the 12, tried to stick together. And so we jumped in a truck. And we went into the unknown in that dark, dark night that happened to be Friday night. And so we knew 
we are out for a surprise here, you know. But we were praying all the time. We were committing ourselves no matter what happened. We're going to stick together. We're going to stick with the Lord. So you were a student, and all of a sudden you find yourself a prisoner, and you're being whisked off into the night, uh, landing in a concentration camp. And you mentioned there were approximately 50,000 other Christians. 50,000 people there, young ar people. Ar around the area. Around the area in different camps. Pl about placed in different concentration camps. Yeah, uh, about 150 in each camp. And so there was about 150 in your camp, and That's there were 12 right. of you that were Seventh-day Adventists. That's right. And so the night passed, light came on, and they took us to a place where uh, about 5,000 of these young people would be congregated. And uh, we didn't want to do anything against our conscience. And uh, we, um, we kind of refused to go. They dropped us like potato sacks in the trucks, and on they went. And then we landed in this big camp. It seemed like headquarters of some kind. Uh, and uh, there were thousands of kids there. So they drop us there and uh, they, they push us all the way until they set us on a formation that had many, 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 many rows. And uh, they began to give us orders. And uh, of course, you can imagine we we're praying all the time. And uh, so this uh, captain, came to us and said, well, now you're going to start moving as I direct you. Began to try to turn us to the right, march to the right, and march to the left. He said, we needed some organization. And uh, we, the 12 Adventists, would stay put there, wouldn't move. And the other people would have crouched against us from right and left and uh, from, from behind. And we were at the very front. And so he said, uh, you're going to move. Because his pistol... Uh, brought it in front of all of us, the 12, he said, you're going to move. Yeah, now, and, and was this said, a Sabbath? You said this it was, was a Sabbath morning. Okay, this was Sabbath morning. Right? Exactly. You were, you were captured on Friday. Was it Friday? It was Friday. And so now it's Sabbath morning, and we that's now it's the lineup. We traveled for 12, 15 hours. And, uh, and uh, he said, now you're going to move. And we said, no. Well, he stepped back. He gave the orders. And nothing happened. He came forward. He said, open your mouth. He got his pistol into my mouth. And he said, now you're going to move. To tell you the truth, I was scared to death. But you know what? I was just trusting in the Lord that He will do His will with me and, and with the others. And so I still refused. Oh, I couldn't say no, but I still refused. So I stepped back, and when, he, when we didn't move, then He said, bring ropes. We are going to hang them up. And then they tied ropes to our, to our heads, took us out of the camp. You know, and, uh, well, they didn't kill us. They said we need them for working because we, they, we needed to produce a hard currency for the country. It was sunset when the whole, the whole ordeal was coming to an end. It's from the beginning of the morning to sunset, and we lay behind a barrack. I remember the 12 of us. We were so tired, exhausted, and we lay. We saw the sun setting in the, in the, in the, in the west, and the stars of God began to appear in the horizon. And one of the boys, we were silent, one of the boys said, we crossed the Red Sea. And one of the others said, but we have to stick our feet in the water. Because we were deciding right there, who we would serve. So, Not later, just right there from the beginning. And so the, the, the ones that didn't move on the line, those were the 12 of you because you were Seventh-day Adventists, right? Exactly. And because it was the Sabbath. Whereas I'm assuming the others, they moved. Everybody moved. Except for you guys. Exactly. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the That's three right. men that didn't bow down. That's right. And the next day, they took us to work cutting sugar cane. I don't know what it's like, you know, but they have long leaves that cut through your skin and hard, hard labor. And, and the temperature in, in those areas get up at 115 and 20. So that was the conditions. And um, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we worked. When sunset came on Friday, we stopped working where we were. And um, they didn't understand that one, so we began to try to explain to them. They said, no, you're going to work. Well, uh, we finally, well, we refused. Finally, next day, they brought us to work. We refused. They dropped us on the trucks, so like potato sacks, as I said. And they, they brought us, they pushed us all the way to the edge of the, of the plantation. And we need to start just, just cutting the sugarcane plants, and we refused. And they would throw the hose at us, and we would just close our eyes, and they would hit us and go on the floor. 
and then they will come. They were so mad. They will get the hose, put them in our hands, tied up our hands to it, and then one soldier will grab the right hand, the other the left, and one will push from behind, and they will begin to do this and push us. And they say, now you're working. And we'll say, no, you are working. We're not working. And, and you, were, you were not working because... The commandment says here, exactly. the seventh was, day is the Sabbath of the Lord, exactly. and it's it says that you shall not do any work any on the work seventh on day the seventh Sabbath. Day it's Sabbath. God's law, God's commandments. You're, you are followers of Jesus, and because of the commandment, you said, I can't do it. Well, you see, it was the devil's will or God's will. And the battle was played in our lives. That was the battleground. Yeah, and, and that so is it, just like the It was the up to us to decide, you know, what direction we would take. And, and, and that, that's what this whole series is about that we're doing on the Sunday Law Crisis and, and the Bible and the Beast and the Mark and Sabbath Sunday and all this controversy. Uh, it, it's a battle for the soul and we have to make a decision. Yeah. Are we going to really follow what the Word of God says or, or are we going to follow the tradition of men? And so I see your struggle as uh, uh, like a type or indicative or an example of the struggle that a whole lot of us are going to be going through in the very final times when the mark of the beast is enforced by law and we have to make a choice. Are we exactly. going to go along with the beast and the traditions of men and Sunday and the mark or are we going to follow God, the Bible, Jesus and the Ten Commandments that the Lord wrote with His own finger on stone where He said, remember, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, mm -hmm. the day of the Creator, the day of God Amen. that He wrote with His own finger. So keep going. <laughs> Tell us more. Well, they attack us in so many areas. They try to, to force us into surrender. And so the long hours, for example, was one of them. We could go to work in the morning. They would took us 5 a.m. in the morning, but we'd never know when we would uh, come back. And so I remember working three days without eating, without drinking water, mostly, and without sleeping. Three days in a, in a row. And uh, we would come back, rest for a few hours, and take it a, a, again. Now, another area was food. <laughs> can, you imagine, uh, can you imagine this? We survived most of the time on one boiled potato and two crackers. Cuban crackers are about this big, okay? I suppose that altogether it would be... Uh, 500 calories. So imagine your output is 4,000 calories and your in, intake is about 500, 500 calories. There's something wrong here, right? <laughs> okay, you do that in your bank with your money, if more comes out that goes in, you know you're going to be gonna broke. You're going to end up broke, right? Okay, the thing is that we didn't seem to be broken, uh, uh, physically speaking. And we commended among, among ourselves, well, I think the Lord is in charge. Okay, the story of Daniel was being repeated. And we, we were proud of it, okay? Not just for pride's sake, but because we decided, you know, we're going to serve the Lord like Daniel and, and the others. And the Lord was doing his dealings, you know, through us. Okay? Yeah, you mentioned to me something about a conversation you overheard with the captain. Well, yeah, t t tell us that story. That was the very end. But um, uh, a captain from another camp came to visit with the captain from our, our camp. And we overheard them speaking, and the guy who came said, uh, uh, do you have Seventh-day Adventist kids here? Yes. He said, have you succeeded in kind of changing them? You know, another word for it will be brainwash them. He said, oh, no, oh, no. He said, you know what? These kids, if you mistreat them, they sing songs. If you don't give them food, they look healthy anyway. He said, and I'm about to believe that as you kill them, they may resurrect on the third day. <laughs> so that was very rewarding to us. That it was getting into their heads. Not, you know, they were trying to change our minds, but it was getting into their heads. So it was, it, it was, it was wonderful. You, you also told me that uh, during the course of those three years, at some point, two of the original 12 Seventh-day Adventists that you were with, they, they gave up their faith. But you mentioned that there were there were others that had been had been watching you, among the other Christians, uh, and and they then chose to join your faith. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, you know, some people think that uh, you just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How you live is not a matter. It's just about your heart. Okay, and and it sounds good, and I know it's true. It's true. But if a Christian life is not lived out, 
Nobody sees it. I can see your faith. I cannot see your faith. You cannot see mine. But if I act like a real Christian, then you can see it. Through those three years, a lot of people began to come to us, tell us something. Tell, tell us more. Uh, a soldier once, uh, his wife came to visit with him. And, and, and it was Sunday morning. It was time for the Adventists to go to work. And he was in charge of taking us. He said, no work today. We said, oh, wow. And he said, but I want you to meet my wife. And that surprised us because they, they were not very kind to us. So he took us out to meet his wife. And then after he introduced us, he went back to the camp and left the 12 Adventists there. And she said, I'll tell you a secret. He said, my husband is changing. He loves you guys. He's doing what he's doing here. He loves you guys. guys. And I'm encouraging him because if he's faithful to God, he'll be faithful to me too. So she was excited about it. And uh, that, that was one of the guys that he told us, frankly, he told us, he said, uh, I'm going to quit the military. I'm, I'm, I'm going to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, kids there, you know, we couldn't baptize anybody, of course, and we were not, you know, even ordained ministers or anything like that. But there were a lot of kids who became Adventists in their hearts. And after they left the camp, they joined the church. I was surprised. They came to Miami from, from Cuba when we finally they deported us, by the way. And that's and, after you got, it, you got out after three years, right? You were Out into Cuba, which is another big camp. Because you can't go anywhere. But I mean, uh, we were deported and we, we landed in Miami. We went to, on the Sabbath, we went to a church. And I found a bunch of kids there that had been in the camp. Really? And so, they, yeah, they made their way, you know, uh, God's willing into the church. And uh, So the influence of somebody that tries to do uh, things the way God wants them to be done is incredible. You preach more with your life than when you, with your words. Are there any, I'd like to read a promise that I've, I've found, and if you can think of any, just tell me any special promises that really encouraged you during that time. Uh, in Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus said, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and mm -hmm. you will have tribulation, Jesus said. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. To me, this is a wonderful prom promise. I've, I've thought about if our ministry continues to take public stands like we've done on these big issues about the beast, the image, and the mark, that it's very possible that you know, something will happen to me someday. I've got a, a wife and two kids, and I certainly wouldn't look forward to, uh, to persecution. But if I do have to suffer, I need to... I need to trust Jesus and trust the promises. And this is a great one where Jesus says, do not fear any of those things which you will suffer. Be faithful till death, and I'll give you the crown of life. It takes uh, being spiritual to be able first to understand that and then to live by it. Because, of course, some people say, you're going to be mistreated, you're going to be persecuted. I mean, those are not uh, apparently good news. But if you really understand the spiritual things, you really understand the Lord, you know what he went through is an honor. It is an honor to serve him. And while we were there, we were not thinking about when we're going to be out of here or if we will be ever out of here or anything like that. We, we just felt like uh, we're here representing the Lord who represented so well that he was willing to give his life. And so we shut down the whole all the concerns in life and concentrated in what we were there for. At first, we didn't understand what we were there for. When we, we see conversions, then we thought, this is a missionary ground. Wow. Now, the Lord took us out of studying to be ministers and gave us a different kind of preparation, okay. one that I would have never gotten in any seminar. So, um, how to prepare for persecution, preparing for persecution. I've got a few thoughts here. Of course, we need to be surrendered completely to Jesus. We need to learn the promises, trust the promises. We need to trust that, as the Bible says somewhere, as your day is, so shall your strength be. That when we're in these terrible, difficult situations, when uh, our, our, our bodies are potentially suffering and our, our lives are at stake, that the Lord will give us supernatural strength during those times. To, to stand up. And as you mentioned, realizing it's really a privilege to suffer for Jesus. And, and then the last one I have here is to realize that if we do die, like Jesus said, if we're faithful till death, 
the next thing we'll know, it'll be resurrection morning, we'll and nice. he'll give us the crown of life. So I, I thought about if I ever was That's beheaded, uh, that the next thing I'd know, wow, I'd be seeing Jesus when he comes on Amen. resurrection morning. That's and why I say we have to be spiritual, because if we do not understand and treasure those things, we're going to give up, uh, you know, at the first trial in our lives. Um, can I tell the little story about sure. the, the Bible? Yes, of course. Of course. How could you survive without a Bible, without studying the Word of God? Well, we didn't have any Bible, of course. Yeah, they search us, they strip us of everything. And uh, when we came in, so they confiscated everything we had. But through a farmer in the area, which we saw once in a while when he took us to work, we got a Bible. The farmer gave you a Bible. The farmer gave, gave us a Bible. Okay. And so we hid it. And then every night, at the light of a flickering candle, one of us, I mean, we organized a church inside there, you know, it was interesting. So one of us would read the Bible and the others would put their heads together in the darkness. And under that flickering li uh, light, we would read about Joseph, we would read about Daniel. Uh, w you know, we, we, we tried to get acquainted with others that made it. I, I, we loved Hebrews chapter 11, you know, by oh, faith, right. by faith. See, by faith, I mean, th their faith was not something that stayed in their hearts. Faith was acting out, you see, by faith. Well, you know, we treasure all those things and we know if God did it for them, he can do it for us. And so the Bible, since the, the soldiers found out there was a Bible, they didn't know who had it or what it was, but the, the, we know they will be searching for it. So one night somebody went out, we had a, a plastic bag, we put it in it, opened a hole in the ground with a spoon, there's all the tools we had, set the Bible uh, in it, close it down with dirt, then we put a stone on it, okay? And every night, one of us was commissioned to crawl out of the barrack, go there, risking being shot by the sentinels, and uh, we'll dig the Bible out, retrieve it, take it, crawl back all the way, and then we'll read our 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever time we have, and then another guy will take it back and bury it again and come wow. back the same way. Every day. Why did we do that? We think, uh, because we thought it was a duty? No, because we needed to be fed with a spiritual nourishment. Wow, praise God, that's incredible. Uh, I, I think about Daniel chapter three, which talks about certain Jews that would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's Amen. image. And everybody else bowed down, but they wouldn't. And the reason why they didn't was because the second commandment says, you shall not make any graven image for yourself. So these Jewish young men, just as you were a young man in the concentration camp, they refused to bow down to the breaking of the second commandment. And the king said, if you don't bow down, you're going into the fire. And they finally uh, came before the king and they said that God is able to deliver us out of this burning fiery furnace. But then they said, it's, this is powerful. But if he doesn't, Daniel 3, 18, if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. That is total surrender. Yeah, and, and a surrender that's willing to take a stand. That's willing to take a stand. And it's risk everything. And, and these stories, these accounts in the book of Daniel parallel the book of Revelation so that when we get to the final scenes, when the mark of the beast is enforced and there's an image of the beast set up, just like there's an image in Daniel 2 or 3 where they wouldn't bow down to this image in Revelation 13, there's another image, an image of the beast that is set up and a mark of the beast that is enforced. And that mark, instead of the second commandment, it's the fourth commandment. Yeah. And God is going to have a people just like you and just like the three Jews. He's going to have a people who stand up for the fourth commandment in the final days. Amen. because Not because uh, they, they, they're earning their salvation through their obedience, not because they're working their way to heaven, but because they have, their hearts have been captured by, for their by the love of Jesus Christ and what he did for them and the Amen. sufferings that Christ went through for them. And again, if you look at history, I mean, John the Baptist lost his head, uh, Paul lost his head, persecution has been going on throughout history. And uh, it'd be great if the Lord would protect us during the final times like he did Martin Luther. Luther never died. 
uh, or at least he died, but I mean he, he didn't die a martyr because God protected him. Some God will protect miraculously like he did you in the concentration camp, but there will be others that will lay down their lives for the Lord Jesus. And whether it's the second commandment, the fourth commandment, the fifth commandment, any of the commandments, we just cannot bow down and break God's law because our Savior sacrificed his life because we broke the law and he died in our place. And that shows the law cannot be changed. But it's, it's eternal and we love him and we want to do what's right. And so we have chosen to become commandment keepers by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I'm sure you have a lot more to say. And we just, we're, we're out of time, but uh, I'd like to finish with, with uh, an article that I have here called Line in the Sand. Line mm. in the Sand. The date was March 5. 1836, Colonel William Barrett Travis was inside a fort called the Alamo. Very famous story. In fact, I was just in San Antonio and I was I, right next to the Alamo. And he knew the situation was hopeless. Uh, Mexican General Antonio Lopez de Santiana, uh, he knew, or th they knew that he was coming in and they couldn't keep him out. So Travis and about 189 other people they knew that they were surrounded and that death was at the door. And significantly, it was a, it was a sa Saturday afternoon, Sabbath afternoon, when, they, when uh, Travis made a speech. He said, we, we have to die, but we have to choose what manner we're going to die. And he, then he, drew, he took his sword and he drew a line in the sand and he slowly marked out this line in the dirt and then he asked, if you're willing to die, cross over the line. And almost everybody did except for one. They all crossed the line, willing to give their lives. And the phrase, the slogan, remember the Alamo, comes down to today. And the fourth commandment of God's word says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath mm -hmm. is a day that points to our creator who gave his life on a cross for our sins. And if we truly love him for what he did for us, we are willing to take a stand. Amen. And he will give us the strength Amen. to stand for him who gave his life for us. And if we have to die for him, well, bless his name, I will be faithful. So God help us to take a stand in these last days.